In a previous video, I linked to a painting by the Norwegian painter Edvard Munch. I may be mispronouncing his name, I don't know. Um, and he's the fellow who did The Scream, uh, that famous painting about anxiety and existential uh, horror. Um, there's another interesting painting, and probably my favorite work by this uh, artist. It's called The Madonna, and I particularly like the lithograph of that. It's um, the archetypical um, Mère Fatale, the Fatal Mother. Um, it's a portrait of a woman from the point of view of a man who is in the process of uh, getting her to conceive. It's a woman who's being ejaculated into uh, with the evidence of uh, what's going to result at, uh, once uh, they're done uh, with their, uh, their business of impregnating her. There are two people involved. Uh, interestingly, it's Madonna, uh, which is the uh, usual name given to Mother Mary. Uh, it's something of a negative view of uh, motherhood, uh, in a, to, to understate it, or perhaps a cynical or dark view of motherhood. In other words, um, this Madonna is actually bringing all the pain into the world. Um, her vagina is something of a Pandora's box because what goes in um, is, well, we know what goes in. Uh, the male element goes in and what comes out is all the suffering of the world. That's one view, and uh, it's not without its antecedents in a lot of cultures, um, this idea of uh, women being fundamentally responsible for all the evils of the world. I mentioned uh, some of the Catholic mind games that uh, I'd seen in action, and one of them is um, a uh, deliberate uh, subversion of healthy um, healthy emotions, uh, to use them against people in order to, um, in order to weaken them and bend people to the, to, the, to the will of someone who wants to impose their power on them. I believe that uh, the basically um, good and normal and healthy and affirming uh, emotion of motherhood is often abused in this way as well, especially when it's somehow seen as sinful to be a mother. To a lot of women, becoming a mother is pretty much the culmination of their existence. Um, one often refers to the uh, interesting um, phenomenon of uh, ecstasy that a female who has just given birth experiences when she first looks into the face of her child that she's just delivered. Um, it's uh, oxytocin, apparently, is responsible for that. It's a hormone that's apparently... Um, intimately uh, involved in love. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is a lot of people point to motherhood as simply uh, fulfilling a need. Well, one would assume then that if in this usual uh, cynical view of uh, human emotion and human aims and the fundamental nature of human beings, that if a person had fulfilled this need, if uh, once... Um, uh, our Madonna in the painting below had been impregnated, uh, she's fulfilled her need and once the baby is out, it's no longer important. The thing is, the exact opposite happens. The impregnation is just the beginning. Um, it's the beginning of something which often is a lifelong process, a lifelong phenomenon of love and of thinking of another human being as somewhat um, all-encompassing, as someone who is more important than the mother or anyone else. Now, one can say again that that's hormonal, but wait a minute, aren't we talking about um, this as a need? Aren't we talking about this as an addiction, as life addiction, as uh, bringing unnecessary suffering into the world? One would assume that um, that uh, if this were indeed an addiction, then not actually having this would result in positive pain. People who actually uh, uh, cannot actually uh, get uh, any sort of pleasure or even an equilibrium unless they actually have 
this, uh, this addiction. The junkie has to constantly load his veins just to feel normal. Um, it doesn't work like that in love. You feel better than normal when there's love involved. You can say that, that that's just because there's drugs being, uh, or hormones being pumped into your brain or into your nervous system. That's all very well. Um, even assuming that being the case, why is it that the positive ones are being fed into your brain? That's not addiction after all. Addiction is do this or else. Um, something more positive is do this because. The junkie eventually is simply fending off withdrawal. He doesn't feel good unless, he doesn't even feel normal, he feels bad, positively bad, if he actually doesn't have uh, his addiction um, being adhered to, being fed. Um, motherhood doesn't work like that. It's, a, it's an actual positive thing. Um, it's an affirming thing. Um, it is something that is pure unto itself. I, sh I shouldn't say pure. I don't want to use that kind of uh, language to describe it, but something that is sufficient unto itself. It creates peace. It doesn't create um, euphoria. It doesn't turn you into uh, someone who is in a drunken stupor or a, a, a drug-induced haze, a drug-induced euphoria. You can still function very well when you're in love. And in fact, a lot of people uh, find love to be an enormously motivating thing. Um, this is uh, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha, which I think a lot of um, idealistic young people read and a lot of people actually return to um, throughout their life. It's interesting uh, what uh, Herman Hesse um, uh, concludes or puts into Siddhartha's mind when we're referring to love. Um, Their vanities, people, their vanities, desires, and trivialities no longer seemed absurd to him. They had become understandable, lovable, and even worthy of respect. There was a blind love of a mother for her child, the blind foolish pride of a fond father for his only son, the blind eager strivings of a young vain woman for ornament and for the admiration of men. All these little, simple, foolish, but tremendously strong, vital, passionate urges and desires no longer seem trivial to Siddhartha. For their sake, he saw people live and do great things, travel, conduct wars, suffer and endure immensely, and he loved them for it. He saw life, vitality, the indestructible, and Brahman in all their desires and needs. These people were worthy of love and admiration in their blind loyalty in their blind strength and tenacity. The men of the world were equal to thinkers, equal to the thinkers, in every respect, and were often superior to them. Just as animals, in their tenacious, undeviating actions, in cases of necessity, may often seem superior to human beings. Have you ever seen a woman at her workstation, uh, she works in an office, she'll have little pictures of her children or her family in general. You can look at that and say, my, my, this individual is satisfied with so little. It's just a baby. Who cares? It's a little more than that to her. Um, it's a little more, it's a tad more than biological imperative to her. To her, that's an exalted uh, state, this state of the symbiotic, uh, mutually beneficial feeling of love, feeling that she has for her child. I'm not saying that all parents feel this way, but I don't think that anyone will say that no parents feel this way. It's not simply, I better have kids or else my brain will be flooded with uh, negative feelings, or um, I think I'll just uh, lay back like our Madonna in the picture down there and um, Let's just see what comes out afterwards. I don't really care. I'm not really thinking this through. People think it through. Um, people base their entire lives on it. People do things um, which are not describable as uh, anything else than wonderful, uh, if a human action can possibly be wonderful, for the sake of love. Is it, uh, is it just um, a biological imperative? If it is merely a biological imperative, if we merely do this blindly, why the strength of feeling? 
why the strength of character that it can give us. I'm sorry, but um, you can fra you can frame this sort of um, issue of the love that human beings have for each other as cynically as you want. But that only illustrates an inability to see what the people who are involved in that dynamic are experiencing. To them, it is reality. And it's a higher form of reality to them than merely existing as a biological or physiological entity. Thank you.